are alive, you are alive. Good morning and welcome to a cold, windy, blustery Juma Private Game Reserve. My name's Brent Leo Smith. I have VM on camera. And welcome to Safari Live. Uh, for those of you who not, might not recognize me, I've been on leave for a couple of weeks, um, but back now, really excited to get out here and try to find you some animals. And so we're going to be heading down our northern boundary towards the eastern boundary. I heard some lions calling about half an hour ago. Unfortunately, I do think they are out of our Travis area, but it's always worth having a look and getting reacquainted with the area around Juma. We have a Scotty and Tebs on the other vehicle, and we have a Kirsty and Nikki in final control. So great to be back, and uh, let's go see what we can find. As you can see, in the two weeks I've gone, the, most of the green grass that was here before I left has seemed to be burnt by the sun. And uh, I've been traveling throughout Southern Africa. And it is not only here that is lacking in rain. It seems like the majority of South, Southern Africa is under this El Nino system that it's at the moment. Uh, hopefully we will get some rain. Um, from what they're saying is we will re resume sort of regular rainfall from March. Uh, and obviously that's going to lead to a very, very dry year. And I know a lot of you are worried about all the animals, but one must remember that these dry years are part of nature and are actually quite good for the bush. And um, we've gone through a very wet 10 year cycle. So a lot of these smaller scrubs and stuff here that have grown up during the rain while uh, animals like elephants have been focused on eating the bushes, um, have encroached on the bush a little bit and that's also part of nature's cycle and now as we get really dry the elephants will start opening up the areas a bit more feeding far more off bushes than they would off grass uh, and what that does is actually promotes grass growth or when we do get rain uh, obviously grass needs sun and the most grass species the good grass species out here don't like growing under bushes so it's on the short term bad for some of the animals but in the long term it's good for the bush and um, nature works in cycles. On average, we work between a seven and eight year wet cycle and a seven and eight year dry cycle in Southern Africa. A big thank you to all the welcome backs. Uh, it's great to be back. Really excited to be out on safari this morning. And a prize would like to know how was the fly fishing uh, from a serious fly fishing lady. Well, the fly fishing wasn't too good. Uh, unfortunately, there were quite a few of us on the boat, so that made fly fishing a little bit difficult. I had some little tigers on, on the fly rod, uh, but we had some very good fishing uh, on conventional tackle. And Unfortunately, I didn't manage to land that monster tiger. It got away, but did catch a few tigers and um, some very nice vundu. Uh, for those who are not sure what a vundu is, it's actually a very rare species of fish these days um, that occurs in the Zambezi River below Victoria Falls. It's a very large species of catfish uh, getting upward of sort of uh, 50 kilograms, uh, which is uh, just over 100 pounds. Uh, I, did, I was lucky enough to catch two that were oh, probably around 50 pounds, 55 pounds. Um, and I will post pictures later, I just haven't had a chance to edit all of them. Uh, and of course we had quite an adventure, uh, Andrew and myself, uh, due to uh, some interesting flight scheduling by Air Zimbabwe. Um, on our way there we got stuck in Victoria Falls with an unscheduled three-day visit which was great fun and we went white water rafting, went and had a look at the falls, went on a boat cruise on the Zambezi River uh, and then off down to Lake Kariba uh, where we spent five nights on a houseboat with Andrew's parents and it was absolutely stunning. Uh, the lake is at its lowest since sort of 1992 which was when the last really big dry cycle was, uh, also the last major El Nino. Uh, so with the lake being low, you've got these wonderful open sort of flood plains, and we saw lots of game, lots of elephant, uh, and then I went walking up to a few of them, and lots of hippos, lots of other game as well. Unfortunately, no cats, 
but we were fishing, not looking for cats as much. Morning, Patrick in sunny Arizona. Uh, Patrick would like to know who caught the biggest tiger fish, Andrew, why? Well, I'm gonna let you guys guess. Who do you think caught the biggest tiger fish? Oh, and the biggest fish. Uh, why don't you let us know who you think caught the biggest fish between Andrew and myself? And you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email us on questions at wildearth.tv. So far, only zebra tracks. So, those of you who have been watching Twitter, and Facebook, and whatnot, and Instagram, will notice that uh, Scott and myself were searching for a spitting cobra. Um, early this morning. So, VM was actually the one who located the cobra last night before he went to bed. He went to get himself a glass of warm milk and uh, he opened the kitchen door and saw a spitting cobra on top of the toaster in the kitchen. And so he closed the door and very sensibly put a, a big thick line of sand over under the door so you could see if it had come out overnight. So it hadn't. Uh, the one negative about the Cobra this morning is it affected Kirsty's coffee making capabilities, so she was late delivering the coffee, which is just unacceptable. I mean, she should just brave the Cobra so we can have our coffee on time. But uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we didn't find it. Obviously, we didn't have that much time this morning, so we just put a sign on the door, making sure Mama Z and Tandy didn't go in there till Scott and I can get back and lift and open open the back of the fridges because when it's cold like this quite often those uh, snakes will go inside the mechanism of the fridges or the stoves so we will have a proper look and we will if we do catch it or find it we will post pictures later on today uh, so while we continue our search for the elusive big cats of the sabi sands uh, let's go see scotty who's got a very large member of africa's big five good morning everyone and perfect timing Look at this majestic elephant bull, two giraffe in the background, and another youngster that he's about to pass now. Ellie looks like he's in a bit of a playful mood. He's got a bit of a swagger about him. But even though we've been parked here for quite some time, he's not interested in coming and saying hello. I thought he was going to come and investigate us. But it looks like he's got other plans for the morning. Maybe he's trying to catch up with a herd of ladies. Definitely not the bull we saw a couple of days back. That one had much bigger ivory, but still a massive, massive an animal. And we'll see if we can't catch up with him a little bit later because I'm interested. Look at him testing the wind there with that periscope-like nose. And the wind is blowing gently kind of towards us from his direction. So that gives you an idea of the direction of wind. You can see the leaves of the bush willow tree in front of us now blowing quite strongly. There's a fairly stiff breeze this morning. Let's reposition and spend some time with these giraffe. A lot of you will know who they are. Morning again, I'm Scott and we've got Tebs on camera. Just going to turn off the VR rig, which you can see flashing like a disco ball in front of us. I had it on in the hope that that Ellie bull was going to come right up close to us, but he didn't, so that video will be no good to us. And just to let you all know exactly what that is, it's basically a camera or seven cameras that film 360 degrees. You can see a few of the lenses pointing towards me, a few up into the sky, and 
What that allows you to do is then watch a 360 degree video and you choose where to look. Really cool stuff. Anyway, these giraffe, some of you will know or recognize. And you can see the bull on the right, kind of hunched over, much darker than the female on the left. And he's been following her for about three or four days now. And you'll see as she walks off, he's probably not gonna let her go too far out of his reach because she must be coming into season and he's hoping that he's gonna be the lucky boy who gets to mate with her. You'll often see him sniffing behind her legs. And interestingly, what sometimes happens is that the females will actually urinate when the male is behind them, testing them in order to allow them to better process their state of estrus. She is still playing incredibly hard to get. There's a product of her previous mating, a young calf. So a great start to the morning. I'm sure a lot of you are happy to see Brent back. We certainly are. And I'm told he's been regaling stories of his tour to Zimbabwe with Andrew. It sounds like they had a great time. And I'm sure he also told you about the snake in the kitchen. And I'm not sure if he mentioned this, but Vim, the cameraman who bumped into the snake last night as he was packing the one rubbish bin away into the kitchen so that the hyena doesn't steal it, as he walked into the kitchen, he says the cobra reared up like a horse off the microwave, which I think is a wonderful description. Um, and that'll be a good post safari challenge to try and find out where the snake is hiding probably in the workings of the fridge keeping nice and warm and what i'm hoping for is that we'll be able to catch the snake and then hopefully do a little bit of a demonstration when we release it later today so that's a plan no guarantees that it'll actually happen okay well the giraffe are playing hard to get not only for the male but for us so let's continue and see if we can't catch up with that Ellie bull again. And it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on these giraffes. They haven't moved a huge distance in the last few days. They've always been in this kind of northwestern corner of Juma. And it'll be wonderful if we actually get to see them mating. I've only seen it happening once and I was fascinated by how quick the whole process was. The male literally jumps up onto the female and then in the same movement penetrates and copulates and then falls off. Very, very quick, unless I wasn't seeing it happen properly, but it's not a, a very long process. But an interesting one, nonetheless, you can imagine that an animal with an anatomy like that makes for interesting mating procedure. Thereafter, we're going to be having a long wait to see when she gives birth. It's 15 months and she could be just about anywhere by then. Giraffe aren't territorial, so you don't get to know them individually, like some of the other animals here. So I haven't been across to Arethusa since I've been back and really looking forward to exploring our western traverse area to see what's changed and what's happening there. Up until I got back basically there's been a pack of wild dogs that's been spending a lot of time in this area and it would be wonderful if they've returned. I believe they last headed further south out of Arethusa but they're going to return at some point and who knows maybe it's this morning. sign of where that elephant bull has gone. I have been looking for tracks and signs of him, but no joy. He seemed like he was on a real mission. <laughs> Cheesy cheetah. Don't worry, we haven't forgotten about your request a few days back. And not only your request, 
it's a kind of a promise that cheesy future uh, made to us, so saying that um, whichever presenter finds the first snake will be cheesy cheetah's favorites for how long i'm not too sure we haven't read the fine prints of this deal but you get an idea of how keen cheesy cheetah is to see a snake i guess if in fact we do get a hold of this mozambique and spitting cobra that vm saw last night then it'll be a joint effort so then you're going to have to have two favorites possibly three if jamie's out of bed by the time we get back and I'm sure she's enjoying a much-deserved lie-in this morning after lots of hard work over the last few weeks. With no relief, really. Only two guides on the ground. But don't worry, Cheesy Cheetah, we'll get lucky at some point. And I'm told, Georgie, you were interested to know what Jamie was up to and where she was. She's curled up in bed. Like I said, deserving uh, well-earned sleeping. So we did get a little bit of rain last night. Some of you may have been on the Juma waterhole camera and noticed that. I'm not sure how long it lasted for, but it started at about 9 o'clock. And it was a fairly decent kind of downpour, nothing serious, it wasn't a storm, it was more pitter-patter, but decent strength, but you wouldn't think so driving around now, the earth is just so thirsty that everything's being absorbed up so quickly, <coughs> but what it means is that it's making our lives a little bit difficult when it comes to tracking, depending on the, the substrates and the soil, some becomes mushy and muddy, which receives and leaves a clear imprint, but other tracks or other roads solidify almost like cement. And that's, I guess, the majority of the roads that we're dealing with. So even though I'm looking for tracks now, it's tricky. That's not a major concern though, because you don't have to track and find all the animals out here. And I know Brent has just found you another animal that he would like to share with you. Welcome back uh, from an elephant to bull. So it looks like a breeding herd. We're just on the peripheries here. Okay, it's a young bull right on the edge. And I can hear some more behind him. And you can see there's actually a couple in there. You just see the movement. Probably enjoying this cool weather. Still finding little bits of grass under the trees to, or under the bushes to eat. Also good to just sit quietly for a little bit while we're with these ellies and uh, see if we can hear anything. Nice cool morning, there's a strong possibility the cats could be on the move. Female there. You can see, looks like she's breaking up a little baby torchwood there. And again, an unusual species when there's a lot of food around for elephants to feed on. But when it is so dry like it is at the moment, uh, they will take use of a lot of plants that you don't normally see them eating in times of plenty. strong wind you can see the leaves and that blowing in front of the eddy and so in this thicker bush we're not gonna off-road after them oh 
Oh, it sounds like there's some more on the other side of us. Can't see them, just hear them. Just hear branches breaking all around us. So this could be quite a large herd. I'm going to sit tight for a little bit, see if anyone pops out into the open. span of an elephant is. Unicorn is very, very similar to, to a human being. It's about 65 years um, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the long end. Normally sort of 55 to 60 is a, a safe assumption. I'm just gonna try to get your visual as a little one. Got a few of them through there. Oh, oh wait. Okay. Uh, looks like gonna move on to the open and just go forward a bit. Uh, and what happens is an elephant being such a huge animal, it's very seldom that they're ever killed by predators uh, outright. So what normally happens is that they run out of teeth and they're unable to digest. How's that, Jim? Um, they're able to digest, are unable to digest their food. They're really not great digesters. They only digest about 60% of what they eat. And so once they're out of that last set of teeth, oh, itchy ear. Uh, they they actually normally die of starvation. Here's a little little chat. Hiding behind a round leaf teak. Very quiet morning. Almost no birds calling. saying well, the one female looks like it could be quite old judging by the indents on her head um i didn't have a good look brian so it's very strong possibility there's one it is one of the sort of signs of aging in ellies uh, but also sometimes in dry and trying conditions those indents can become more pronounced in younger animals what a great way to start being back with a nice herd of bellies. As I said, unfortunately, not right out in the open at the moment. And with this strong wind, and they look so relaxed that I'm not going to disturb them by driving any closer. And there's a possibility they might move out towards us. So in these breeding herds, uh, just going on what Brian was saying, we've got lots of different ages. I mean, probably here, the youngest one I've seen is probably around a year old, ranging through to animals that will be in their 50s. Sorry, I just think I just heard something. Very, very faint in the distance, um, far to the north of us. Um, there was lions roaring. Very, very far behind us. So up in the north. Just hear that very faint. So a challenge has been laid down to me by D. Hugs. He says when Scott came back, leopard and wild dog. So I've got to top it. I will try. But this is the bush. And as much as we'd like to think we know what's going on at all times, uh, we're just observers here, so sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. I'm just waiting to see if these eddies come a little bit closer. I'm hoping that they do. Um, other than that, I think they're going to be heading down towards Drakensberg Road slowly. So what we can do is I just want to check further along the eastern boundary for any tracks of cats or dogs. 
uh, and then we'll come back and hopefully by then they've moved out onto that open seep line off Drakensberg Road and we can have a much better view. So let's go check quickly for tracks and then we'll come back to the ellies. to Lorraine and Wendy who voted that I caught the biggest tiger fish. I did. <laughs> um, and we did catch uh, some tigers as well. Uh, but I did catch the biggest one. Let's put the lights on. So the reason I put the lights on in this low light condition um, is not to see where I'm going but it's to see tracks. So what it does is it just shines a little bit along the road there. And what I'm looking for is the shadow created by uh, a track of an animal uh, as it's walked down the road. We did have a little bit of rain last night, which does harden the surface of the road a little bit and makes it a little bit more difficult to see tracks. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to spot them. Uh, well, I suppose when I said rain, rain's a strong word. We had a, a sprinkle. It's probably a better description. Lots of wind and and, and and noise, but very little rain. You can see it almost looks like we're going into winter, but we're at the height of summer and the height of our rainy season. down the road, all is worth double checking. There you go, not much down there I'm afraid, but always worth having a squiz. Uh, Shamrock would like to know, um, during these times of drought, is there an increase in human-animal interaction? Uh, be it negative or positive, uh, and if there is negative interaction, uh, what is sort of used to, to try control it. Shamrock, uh, there definitely, definitely is. Not so much in an area like the Sabi Sands um, or, or Kruger, where um, it's quite separate from, from sort of the local communities and that, the fences and that. And if you head up north in Africa, uh, in Zimbabwe, Botswana, Zambia, Angola, uh, all the way through, um, where there's a lot of very large unfenced reserves. Uh, there is definitely an increase, uh, sort of uh, elephants in particular, and buffalo being the two sort of biggest, biggest problems, because in these times of drought, it's times of plenty for the predators. And you will actually notice, uh, especially animals like lions, their, their numbers will often increase by up to 10, 15% during a time of drought. Uh, but uh, elephants and buffalo, um, general probably and hippo sort of the three worst and what they end up doing is raiding crops uh, in, in a lot of areas and obviously in times of drought people are under strain for food as well as the animals so a nice sort of field of maize uh, provides a sort of beeline for a lot of your large um, herbivores and there's different methods that are employed in different areas I'd probably say the most common method used in Africa is called the pot method. And so I just want to check something and I'll explain the pot method to you shortly. Um, and the pot method is, is quite a sophisticated defense mechanism um, against marauding animals. Uh, just one second, I'll be with you now. Morning orbs, uh, just some of the law, to the cut line, uh, close to the junction of Mumba Road. Sorry about that. So, as I said, the 
pot method, quite a complicated, sophisticated method. Um, what you need is two steel pots, and when the elephant comes into your field, you run towards them, banging them loudly together. And it's very effective, believe it or not. But that is the pot method. I'm just going to check all the way through to the southern boundary. Um, and then I know in Kenya and Botswana, they are trying, uh, which is proving quite effective, uh, bees. So what happens is uh, instead of a fence around crops, um, every sort of 10 or 15 meters, they'll put a beehive. And for some reason, elephants don't like bees more than any other animals. Uh, so that, that buzz or whatnot, having bees around there seems to keep the elephants out. Uh, chilies, chili plants planted around the edge. Apparently, elephant and buffalo don't like chilies. By sulfur, I'm not so certain on the chili. The chili sin, I've seen an elephant walk straight through a, a chili bush in Tanzania. No problem whatsoever. Uh, now, with buffalo and hippo, it becomes quite a lot more difficult. The, the pot method is also used, but they tend to be a little bit more stubborn about moving away from the, those noises. And in extreme cases, uh, certain animals become, do become problem animals, and then the local uh, sort of wildlife authority uh, will either look at destroying them or moving them out of the area, depending on the species. So you do definitely have a, a, a heightened sort of conflict between sort of your large herbivores and, 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 and people, that your sort of predator conflict comes down. I know a lot of you will think it's absolutely terrible that uh, uh, people might, and people actually demand, villagers demand the destruction of elephants and buffalo and, and hippo, but one must remember that that's, that food could be their, their, their livelihood as well as their only sustenance for the year, and now having it completely destroyed, and, and, and a big early bull uh, can wipe out a hectare of maize or, or ground nuts or anything like that in, very, in a very quick, quick time. So also, um, sort of raised platforms are built in the middle of these fields to employ the banging pot method. Uh, and people will actually sleep in the fields to try to keep the elephants and other animals out. And scarecrows, but the scarecrows aren't that effective, but they're put there anyway. Another great cop crop raider is uh, bush pigs. And they can do even more damage than, than an elephant in a very short time. Good morning, Impalas. A very fluffy Impala. And you can see all their hackles are raised and they get that lovely rich rufous when their hackles are raised. Um, and generally only on the cool mornings that they do this. And what happens is they just form a little insulative blanket um, by raising the hair. You can see there that little rufous on the shoulder blade. And so the air gets trapped between their skin and, and and the hair follicles and it creates sort of a warm insulation around them and look at these guys yeah these guys are colder than them and see how puffed all they are that one they are oh now yeah, these two yeah yeah you can see how puffed up that one on the left there is and you can see that coat almost seems to change color and it's got that really dark rufous compared to the rest of it and that's because we're looking below the normal hair so it's not as bleached by the sun and it does give them a wonderful sort of color on these cold mornings. And there we can see those nice three white, black stripes on an impala's bottom and uh, surrounded by white. And one of the reasons for that is that flies are quite often attracted to black colors. So it's to keep the flies out of the sensitive spots and to a degree, obviously it only works a little bit. But uh, those black stripes are to attract flies away from the sensitive areas. And you can see that impala there is feeding off a little bush. Incredibly adaptive animals. Uh, one of the reasons they're so successful throughout Africa uh, is the fact that they are not limited to grass or trees. Uh, so they are able to browse and graze. So it gives them food during the hard times. So we're closing in on the southern boundary. While we do that, um, before we head back towards where those alleys were, uh, let's go see what Scotty D's been up to. Well, I hope Brent has some luck with the line audio that you guys have been following up with them on. 
No major updates from Tebs and myself. Just been slowly perusing Arethusa. We are on the southern edge of the airstrip. That's why this area is so open. And what I was hoping for was the wild dog to be running around here chasing Impala. Not yet, but it could happen. Feel a tiny bit of the finest drizzle on my cheeks. Nothing too serious, but a slight bit of moisture in the air. Here's some Impala ahead of us, the ones that the wild dog was supposed to be chasing around. The wild dog are obviously a little bit late for the appointments. It's actually quite cold this morning. Strong breeze and I'm incredibly surprised to be wearing a jersey in the middle of our summer because it's normally very hot and humid. Let's see if this little bachelor head doesn't get excited and do a little bit of a run around and chase one another for us. So that little crackling communication that you may have heard there was the guys getting out on drive. Everyone's just about heading out now. We're a lot earlier than everyone at the moment, but we are planning on changing the time, so be ready for that, but we will keep you well informed. We're probably going to be heading out ever so slightly later in the coming week or so. Come on, Impala. There's an Impala midden that they're all standing around. You can see a black patch on the ground in front of the one on the left and it's actually smelling there testing it almost like reading emails and is he gonna leave his message behind on this midden i think yeah he is he's taking a piddle so it's used for both piddling and pooping these middens and what it does is it just acts like i say like kind of a a notice board where all the impala can leave their messages for other impala that come past now he's getting a bit more serious leaving a poop message and the word midden actually is derived from a dutch word so if there's any dutch viewers midem not midden with an n on the end with an m on the end oh little tender moment there between the boykies Boikies is an Afrikaans term that also the Dutch people may understand. Or as we have Afrikaans here, which is a language of Dutch origin. Anyway, back to midden and midem, which means haystack in Dutch. And that pile of vegetable matter is, I guess, similar to a haystack in a way. Whereas an area where predators will defecate for the same reasons to act as a notice board will be called the latrine not sure where that word is derived from you also notice the empire looking a little bit fuzzy and furry this morning as am i with my jersey on and they're trying to simulate the same thing as we are by putting on clothes they have the opportunity to erect the hairs on their body thus creating a thicker, thicker, sorry, thermal insulator. So they've got their jerseys on, as you can see, on this cool morning. Good, let's carry on. Susan in California, good to have you on board with us. And you would like to know what the difference is between grazing and browsing. Good one to clear up because there is a big difference. And basically, grazers are animals that feed on the grass. So that's quite easy to remember. G with G, grazing grass and ground, all three G's. Oh, what have they all noticed? They all stopped. It could just be this windy weather, and Antelope will be on extra high alert when it is windy. 
for a number of reasons. Predators can even move with less chance of being detected because there's lots of bushes blowing and lots of general movement from the wind. So their movement is easier, they're stalking closer to their prey is easier, as well as the fact is that they will, will not be able to be heard as easily because there's ambient noise created by the wind. But they're all at ease now, and you can see they're grazing the grass on the ground. What's interesting, Susan, with impala is that they are not fussy, and that's what makes them so successful, and they are mixed feeders, which means they graze on the grass, as well as browse on the leaves. Whereas other antelope like kudu and inyala and bushbuck, they more typically browsers and will only feed on grass in times like this, in times of desperation or droughts. So I'm glad we got to clear that up for you, Susan. And I hope you're having a good time in California. It's nice sometimes just to stop and not be in a big rush to keep moving and that way you can listen and often people forget and don't realize that listening is often one of the best methods of finding animals or finding out information in the bush noise travels a lot further than our eyes can see and therefore by listening you can often get very good clues we could hear a parlor alarm calling in the distance. We could hear the vocalization of a leopard. The list of noises that we could hear is almost endless that could provide us with very useful information. Monkeys alarm calling, like you ex experienced earlier, lions roaring with brents. Whereas if you're on the move permanently, you will not be able to hear anything. Now we are going to have to move, though, otherwise I'm not sure, too sure what Tebs is going to do with regards to filming those impala because they're obviously all behind the bush towards the end there. Morning, Joey, in Australia. And you're asking of owls, and which owls do we get here on Juma? Sadly, we haven't been seeing many owls recently, and I'm not too sure why our luck in that department has been low. There was a period as we kind of went into winter last year, or maybe out of winter, one of the two, where we were seeing quite a good number of owls. But the two owls that you speak of, the grass owl and the barn owl, are two that we don't see very often. But what I'm going to do is just bring out the book and go through all the different owls that we get in the Kruger National Park and in this area. So the grass owl and the barn owl, interestingly, those are the two you're asking of, and they are perfectly lined up next to one another. They look quite similar, actually, as you can see. And I have had a few glimpses of grass owls flying off. They're a very difficult owl to view because usually you flush them off the ground and then they fly off and they're very, very camouflaged. Barn owl, I have not seen with you guys, but they do occur here. So there is a chance we'll see one at some stage. Owls that we have seen and see fairly often are the pearl spotted owlets. Very small owlet. That's why it's got the let on the end. Um, and that's that one. It's cousin the barred owlet below, very similar looking and also very similar in size. The southern white-faced scops owl we can see. I don't think we've managed to get one on camera, but the African scops owl we did get a decent sighting of, and there were a couple hanging around Red Dam here on Arethusa, so they could have been nesting there. Then owls that we see more commonly are the spotted eagle owl and the Varose eagle owl. This is the biggest of all the, uh, the owls, and it can catch prey as large as guinea fowl. Monkeys, even, can fall prey to them. This is an awesome one. I've only ever seen once. We will not see them here, and even in the Sabi Sands, your chances of seeing them are very slim. They are a rare owl, and very, very pretty, and as you can see, it's a fishing owl, so highly, highly specialized. 
And what's interesting is that if you look at the distribution maps here on the left, you'll see all of the other owls are full up all over the Kruger. But then when you get down to the Pals Fishing Owl, you'll see they're only in very specific areas, which is demarcated by the green. This is also quite nice for you to see because it indicates that the Kruger Park is a very long and thin reserve. And I'm just going to unplug my earpiece temporarily to use a little sharp point here. In relation to the whole of the Kruger National Park, this is about 300 kilometers long, which is about probably 180 miles south to north. We are situated somewhere on this little corner here. So we are situated, apologies, I think it's up here somewhere. So we're situated about a third of the way up and on the western side of the Kruger National Park. So we are attached onto this. And this is the Mozambican border, basically. The whole eastern border of the Kruger National Park goes eastern to Mozambique and right up at the top here, north into Zimbabwe. So Brent was up here somewhere enjoying himself in Zimbabwe. With Andrew. Good, there's two more owls that we may as well cover that you can also see in this area, the African wood owl and the marsh owl. So the healthy population of owls can be seen in the Greater Kruger National Park, but I guess for a few reasons, we don't spend too long out at night and simply our luck hasn't been very good. We haven't seen too many recently. Very good. Thank you very much for asking that question, Joey. And we will have to keep our eye out open for you. You can actually see some owls during the day, Joey. And the pearl spotted owlets and the African barred owlets are not completely nocturnal like some of the other owls and will often actually hunt during the day. to give you guys a better idea of exactly how the Kruger works. You saw that much smaller map. So Skakuza is basically the capital of the Kruger National Park. It's the biggest camp. There's even a police station there, lots of kind of infrastructure. It's almost like a town within the Kruger National Park. So that's the biggest camp. And the Sabi Sands is in this funny little corner here. So we basically, our fence runs, the southern Sabi Sands runs along this boundary here and then up into a little bit higher up where we are here. I'm not doing a good job. Good. So that is where we fit in in the Kruger National Park, about a third of the way up. from that general area 
and for those of you who may be joining for the first time, you may be in luck. For the regular viewers, this would be a good opportunity to phone a friend who's never watched Safari Live and tell them that there's a strong chance we end for some of the ultimate action on Safari, and that is follow these animals. Brent is going to be on top form because they're his favorite animal. of just how excited he is right now. Copy, thanks. So really exciting guys, Taxon just found some wild dogs. We're on our way there as fast as possible. Um, we should be about three minutes out now. A little bit of drizzle, so excuse VM if he has to wipe the lens a little bit, a tiny bit of rain, nothing that's going to stop us there. And uh, as uh, most of you know out there, my favorite animal, what a welcome back to Juma. Yeah, but it's not like she's still She's just running around here on the south end of the clearing. Hold on! Uh, hopefully we get to see them hunting. Uh, the most Thanks. amazing Thanks. cooperative uh, hunting hunting strategies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, the most incredible social strategies, but we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, when we're not racing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Okay. okay, getting right to the area where the dogs are now. I'm just trying to see if I can see Taxon quickly. VM spotted them. Uh, the oh, okay. the drizzle. Oh, he's looked at the rain that's coming towards us. So there's quite a bit of rain, quite heavy rain, but hopefully it stays away so we can follow these wild dogs. Yeah, okay. Can't see tax at the moment. This is where they're supposed to be. Uh, I see his tracks going this way, though. Yeah, Tex, I'm on that uh, open area next to the Dead Scotia. Uh, where about are you? Yes, um, uh, we'll go you there. Alright, I'm Okay, guys. We're here now. Oh, they're in some difficult country. There's quite a lot of drainage lines around here. There we go. There it is. There the dogs. It looks like the puppies. Oh, it looks like they've already killed the baby impala this morning. We've got a, a baby impala's leg in its mouth. So incredibly efficient hunters. So I'm not sure where they came from this morning, but it looks like they already have killed. But I'm um, not sure which pack this is. This is probably the Investec breakaways. Uh, you can see there's quite a few of them. And look there, that one's got an ear. One's got a leg and the one at the back's got it. Looks like an ear of the baby impala. No, it's a knee, not an ear. Happy puppies. So a baby impala for a pack this size will be completely gone in under five minutes. Oh, listen, you can hear the little the squeaky squeaks. I love the different sounds they make. Incredibly beautiful coats. Oh, thanks uh, to Gex Gecko. He said, amazing on my first day back. Well, we need a big thank you to Taxon who found them and sent us 
speeding in this direction. There's wonderful colors on their coats, uh, led to their original name, which was the painted wolf. Oh, there we go. Yeah, they come towards us. Not sure where the adults are at the moment. Oh, what's he got there? It's the knee, I think. Yep, uh, it's the bottom half of the foot, the ankle, and the hoof. Dogs don't really have those incredible sort of crushing capabilities of some of the other predators. So there's often quite a bit left, and that often draws hyenas in. And probably not much left on a small carcass like a baby and part of the bones are still soft they're able to eat a lot of them except for those sort of stronger bones around the ankle as you can see and a little bit of dominance behavior going on there here come the adults Wild dogs are incredibly effective hunters. Uh, in certain areas, they have success rates of over 80%. So eight out of 10 times that they chase something, here comes another adult. Um, they catch it. Looks, almost looks like they've heard something. The adults seem to be on the move. Lots of impala and there's puppies running all over the place. Uh, they're coming right up in front of the vehicle now. And there. There's a little bit of grooming off to the right there. Adult playing with the playing with one of the puppies. Another puppy about to leap into the fray. And you see there that's begging. Down and you hear that noise? And you see how it sort of licks and bites the, the lower lip of the adult. And it's still hungry, it wants the adult to regurgitate food for it. So just to warn you with wild dogs, being such effective hunters and not having those big crushing capabilities of some of the other animals, um, sometimes the kills can be quite gruesome. And Barbara's just telling me, so I should warn the younger viewers. Um, oh, incoming, high speed incoming dog. Here we go, more begging. Look at them, here they come. Begging the adults. Hungry, still hungry, we're still hungry. Incredibly social animals. So a small impala, if this is the investic breakaways, there should be, I think, um, 11 pups and three adults. So one baby impala is not going to feed all of them. Oh, we've still got someone off to our right. So, as I'm saying, really successful hunters. 80% success rate. Oh, it's abandoned what was left of the foot. And looks like they're going to be on the move shortly. Which is one of the biggest challenges about following wild dogs is actually staying with them. Just trying to see which way they're going to go. Running around all around us here. I'm not sure. I think we all arrived uh, post-mortem. So I think the dogs had already made the kill, but it's more than likely the adults. Although the pups are moving with the adults, um, they generally only uh, are going to start actively hunting and taking part in the hunt about after six months. Uh, so we're here with the last of the pups. The adults have taken off in a sort of southerly direction and this is quite a difficult block but i am going to try to stay with them you can see lots of little drainage lines and i'm trying to move my way around the dogs are down there you 
Whatever starts with me, if you am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. I'll spot it. So they actually are on their way, possibly towards quarantine. Uh, and there's always in parlor there. And I'm going to try to keep up with them. So I do apologize um, if it's a bit bumpy and a bit loud. Uh, but they are always on the move. And that's what makes them such exciting animals to follow. We're still with the lead dog, you have, have the adults here. Um, and then Aubrey and Taxon are also in the sight, and I know there's another vehicle standing by. So I think what happens, I think Aubrey's behind me here to help me to try to follow them through the bush, and Taxon's gonna go wait for them on quarantine, because that's what it looks like. They're going, just need to be on the radio quickly. Thank you, I'm not waiting, thanks. Okay, I'm just sitting beside you with Aubrey. Okay, I'll uh, make your way towards Western Edge Quarantine, and that's where they're heading at the moment. Okay. They're gonna go into this drainage line now, so I gotta hopefully find a spot where I can cross with them. So you guys might notice I drive over some trees, don't worry, I'm straddling them. And we never drive over any trees. Does it look like we can cross through there? Yeah. Um, that are slow growing. Um, so we try to drive, when we drive over a tree, it's normally over the center, so they pop up behind us. And they're very flexible. Remember, most of these trees are fed on by elephants regularly. Um, so that's us driving over them is actually a very oh they crossed already yes they have okay guys um hold on we're going to try find a way through this drainage system pop out into quarantine because there's always a good chance of a parlor so we've got dogs on either side of us now but the majority of the dogs are over here and they're going to head out onto quarantine look at that it's one of the adults looks like the adult female possibly the mother oh she's gone in through a big hole hold on vim but we've got quite a lot of the dogs still running around us so we're in the right spot and as you can see, it's really difficult to keep up with them. They're constantly on the move. And especially on a nice cool morning like this. So we've got pups here. I've got a few adults in front of me. And the adults are the ones we're going to stick with during the hunt. Because those are the ones that are most likely to make the kill. So there's one of the adult male dogs. There's two adult males and a single adult female. The adult females off to the right. So, okay, they're there, but I'm gonna go ahead of them now. So almost on quarantine clearings. Hello, puppies. So, cat in Tampa. Morning, cat. Sorry, I'm not looking at you. I'm just going to try and get um, through this thicket. Um, cat would like to do wild dogs to kill anything else. It always looks like it's impala. Um, well, impala is their favorite species, but they will kill Steinbok, Daika. I've seen them kill Kudu. And in rare occasions, they even hunt buffalo uh, with really big packs, 30 or so. Okay, we are onto quarantine, guys. We're with the lead dogs. Anything can happen now. So I didn't see any impala on quarantine earlier. The rain is moving in, but it's still quite soft. Here we go. I'm just going to... Stations are now mobile north across quarantine, almost directly towards uh, Via Telecamp. So here we go. We're with the, the lead adults. 
Um, I'm going to try, I'm going to stay parallel to him, but I'm going to try to get a little bit ahead so I can see if there's any impala to put us in the right position. Seeing any impala yet, Jim? see any impala on quarantine yet but they could very easily be we are stopping looking listening so they've got a very different sort of hunting technique uh, to a lot of animals it's called coursing oh look at them go puppies in a great mood nice drizzly cold morning uh, playing he has the ones we've got to stay with the ones are going off behind us uh, the adults, they're the ones who are going to be leading the hunt. Okay, we're just going to swing around. Tammy would like to know, how do I know what pack they are? Uh, Tammy, it's because I've been lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time with this pack. Sorry about the rain, guys. It is coming down a little bit harder. We will stay with them. It's going to seem harder because we're moving at speed um, with the dogs, but it is a light drizzle. And hopefully it doesn't get too much harder and we can stay with my, by far my favorite animal. Now. And we'll see if we can spot any impala um, up ahead. They might head down towards the Juma waterhole. There's always something there. Um, guys, we're going to have to put some rain protection on the stuff. So just bear with the noise for a second. We're good, Vim. Okay. So this is almost ideal hunting weather for them. So Siberia, the zoo says, uh, she believes the pack has 11 pups. That's correct. Do we count 11? Have they lost any? So the last time I saw them, they were 11. I will try count them now. So I'm still wrapping plastic over the camera to try to keep it protected in this wet weather. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So all pups present and accounted for. Uh, these three adults are doing an incredible job. One of the other adult females in this pack I know was killed by a snake at the den in the Manuleti. Um, a very good friend of mine, he, he runs the Endangered Wildlife Trust Wild Dog um, program out in this part of the world. And uh, he, uh, he let me know about that. Okay. Guys, go towards the Juma Water. So any, anyone watching the Juma Water, let me know if there are any animals there. They're not heading in that direction. They've changed direction again a little bit. Um, we will try to stay with them. They're going to have to take me back through the same drainage line we just crossed. Sorry. So we still waterproofing but while we're doing that we're just trying to keep up with them okay so they were heading towards the pan they've now changed direction they're heading sort of slightly more south but they are definitely on the hunt still rain's coming down now but we will, as I said, try to stay with them as long as possible, as long as the weather allows us. Marcia in Oklahoma would like to know, um, well, three adults, is it an alpha pair and a single male or female? Uh, Marcia, it's an alpha pair and a single male. Um, from my looking at the dogs, um, there's one to the right of us, 
Um, at the back, that's the alpha female, and then the one far right is the alpha male, and the one directly in front of us is the uh, helper male. Why are you guys going to be here again? We've just come through this drain. So they had a nice look on the top part of quarantine clearings. They didn't see any possible prey species, so that's why they've changed direction again. down it's going to be very difficult to follow but i'm going to stay with the adult dogs who are heading up um, they're heading down a sort of seep line that runs parallel uh, to the drainage system and i'm hoping they stay on that of the drainage off to our right here. I'm going to stay above her. Oh, why, 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 why? She's crossed the drainage. Just want to see if she comes back. She is heading back towards, but she's still on the other side of that drainage system. Yeah, there's another adult dog there. I'm just going to wait and see what happens. might be able to cross here a little bit. down. Okay. Let's have a look here. We're going to be able to get through here. Maybe not. Oh, oh there's dogs all around us. Okay, well, the puppy is uh, an adult male. But it looks like it's going to go straight where the female went. Um, are there any more behind us? Try to find a spot to get through now. We have all the Franklin being harassed by the pups. when they're moving in and around in a drainage line. Which side are they going to stay on? So here we've got, it looks to be the alpha pair to me. And we're being attacked, stormed by puppies, running around, all around us. Chasing Franklins. Chasing Franklins. Oh, look at this now. So, oh, 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 oh. They're after something. That, I've just seen it. I don't know whether it was a dike or a stem block, but hold on. We're going to try to get out of here. They are highly mobile. They just missed it. I just saw it take off. Um, oh, I think it might have even been a warthog that went down a hole. Oh, well, they had the pair that took off after it, and they wrecked chased. Yeah, it was a warthog. The <laughs> warthog went back down the hole. So there's the warthog. Um, there's a hole in that mound there. Um, so they missed it. So the warthog was obviously just popping his head out to say good morning, and all of the sardine. Um, he popped his head into a couple of wild dogs and decided discretion was the better part of valor and went back down. So you guys, I see you on the radio again. Stations are my dash mobile south. 
on the northern edge of that drainage system that runs from the west of quarantine uh, towards Philemon's dip. One second. There's three stations at the moment, buddy. Okay, thanks. Okay. So we're still with them. Unfortunately, they seem to be coursing. And as I, as I started explaining, but then we had to rush off after them. Uh, a wild dog hunting strategy is called coursing. So they basically jog like they're doing now through the bush, through the bush. They see something that quite often flatten their ears, but they don't take those extreme measures of, of um, not being observed like lions and leopards. Uh, and they do this because they have incredible stamina. 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 And they're able to do sort of 60 kilometers an hour for up to about five or six kilometers um, when they're chasing something. Normally it doesn't take that long, especially in broken country like this, they're incredibly mobile, you can jig and jag and jump over things. Jumping ahead, um, they're going down here, and I can't follow in there, but we're right near the next road. Ah, the station's those. My Dutch are about to come out um, at Philemon's dip. Hold on. Last view of the dog we had was just here. And then we're heading directly for this little spot. Just keep a lookout behind us here in case they pop out behind us. There we go, we've got them. Just saw a flash of a tail. And heading this way. We've got the whole pack coming through. VM's just giving it a clean. Sorry, guys, we are trying our best in this weather. So here they're coming. Keep coming. Should be popping out around here. Ah. So there's Scotty, who's standing by in the area in case we need help because we know how quickly dogs can disappear. Um, there we go. So we've got the alpha female off to the right here. Just change direction slightly. Oh, Daka running behind them. She's seen it, she's seen the Daka. Hold on, hold on, she's changed direction again. The Daka changed direction. So Daka just jumped out of the bush. She's chasing that diker, um, and she was very close to that diker. Oh, it looks like the diker escaped. But it almost ran back into the rest of the pack. Um, so we're just going to switch off and listen, see if we hear anything. But there's the alpha female who chased it. So obviously that diker has some very skilled um, evasion tactics because they've managed to get away from the most successful predator we have. Just let's see now that often when they chase something like that, it can and, uh, determine a change of direction. So I'm just watching where they are. Looks like now they're heading back to exactly where we've just come from. Whoops, you okay, Vim? 
He's had worse. So, the poor cameraman know when um, there's wild dogs around and I'm there, we will be at the forefront trying to keep up with them. that diker um, as it rushed off it sort of jumped up right behind her and almost ran into the rest of the pack but fortunately for the diker or and unfortunately for the wild dog it managed to jinx away from them so we're just gonna watch and wait and let Aubrey go up ahead oh puppy's incoming still playing having a great old time everyone and isn't that exciting stuff being racing around with Brent and that pack of wild dogs we are in the general area there's Brent actually just going fast up ahead um, but there are already three vehicles in the sighting quite nice of you to get an, uh, an idea of the area we're in there and a shot of Brent from here and as long as we kind of keep our distance we'll be able to assist those three vehicles with staying with the pack <clears throat> if they lose them, as you've noticed, it's a lot of racing around, losing visual, gaining visual. So we kind of just helping out by being here. And I'm just going to stand by to hear from Brent where, where they're heading, and then we can loop around and try and be of much as of much assistance as possible. Possible. <laughs> And I've just got a visual of the wild dogs are moving parallel to us in our direction um, down in this riverbed. So, yes, I, I think those pups will start contributing to the hunting. They're not quite there yet. Um, but I think in the next few months they're definitely going to start aiding and assisting in chasing down prey. But for now, they're just hoovering up. A lot of the food that their parents have caught for them. It's incredible how these three adults are doing such an amazing job raising the 11 pups. And let's hope their luck continues because to have 11 pups with three adults for this long after they've started running with the pack, after they've moved away from the safety of their den is quite remarkable. In the past, I've seen huge decline in pack numbers. Once they've started running with the pack, leaving the den, there's a large mortality rate, sadly, of the young pups that are often killed by lion and leopard and hyena. Sure. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do a big loop around and try and get kind of ahead of them. I've just heard Aubrey saying that they're heading towards Twin Dams Road. But what we need to remember is that because there are three adults, they sometimes split up whilst hunting and go off after their own prey. Good news is Brent's back up and running and he's with the pack. See you later. So we're back with the dog. Sorry about that. A gremlin crept in. Um, but they are jigging and jagging through these drainage systems. It makes it quite difficult to follow. Um, I'm going to try to stay with them now. They're all around us here. You see how quickly they can go from sort of just jogging to full speed after a potential prey species. So it definitely pays to stay with the pack as much as possible. And you can see they're completely unfussed about being followed. They're all around us running around. Um, going into some nasty thickets shortly. There's a path through there. 
Oh, have they seen something? Oh dear. Oh, are they playing or are they chasing something? It's, all, it's quite difficult to tell through this thick stuff. type of movement from a dog, um, it means that they're, they're off on the go, uh, or they're playing, and with this many pups running around in this cool weather, sometimes it's a bit difficult. No, that's, that's, I've seen something running, or oh, they're chasing Franklin again, the puppies. Oh, <laughs> ah, this is amazing! These are the best animals in the world to follow. Oh no, don't go that way. Yeah, there's no way we're gonna be able to follow them. Follow oh, see, chasing Franklin, I think that's what the main thing is there. It's the puppies being full of the joys of youth. And off on the move again. No adults there. going to try our best. Sorry, I just need to try and move some stuff. Getting a bit wet, book some things. Liam and I have very wet bottoms at the moment. doing enough to keep it dry at the moment, so I'm just going to pop it in the bag. Of us, so hold on. Whee! Now it's quite nice, a little bit of rain. We can do some rally sliding if need be. So they went into the stick stuff here where none of us can follow. hunters uh, they use their eyes uh, not so much the ears their big ears are actually more in defense of predators uh, when they're around dens and just remember the animals here are so used to vehicles that uh, the impala and, and, and other animals don't really take oh dear they're crossing straight north in front of Aubrey Remember some of us shortcuts to stay with them. Okay, so they've crossed straight north. Just listen to the game drive channel. Everyone, and this is 
this exciting racing around in the rain after wild dogs. Yeah. They've just crossed into a very, very tricky area through this riverbed we're about to drive through, but about 500 meters further up. I've just got an update from Aubrey saying that they are kind of headed back onto Twin Downs Road, which is to our left, west of this drainage. So we just need to hang around in this general area. Brent's last signal, but hopefully that'll pop up soon. And I'm thinking of probably just waiting here. I'm just going to get a hold of Orbs quickly just to confirm his last update. Orbs, I'm just going to stand by in the Mulwati at Spaghetti Junction. And now we wait and hope the next update is a good one. Some of them they cross to the north, uh, we still pull out one uh, sort of print there. Okay, so the majority of the pack have crossed this riverbed. They've just got vision of one where he is, so let's continue kind of a bit of a wider arc with these animals it's often useful to loop way ahead of where they are moving otherwise you'll permanently be stuck behind them go ahead Brent Like Brent and Veer may, may have a wet camera, never good, so they could try and tend to that. And we're gonna slip into their spot. Come on, wild dogs. This is a very, very tricky area to follow and through. It's exceptionally thick. But there's still a good chance they're going to pop out, and who knows, maybe they're going to be chasing some prey straight towards us. should throw in the towel not to risk the equipment that we have we already one camera down and one vehicle down so it would be kind of unwise to take any massive chances because if something does break to get it fixed it may take a long time so we'll give it a few more minutes if the dogs don't pop in I think we will probably call it a morning it's been great quality, not quantity, this morning. I'm just going to stop and listen for a while, see if we can't hear any noises. Interesting thing is, animals actually don't often alarm call. When a pile of sea wild dog, they simply just start running off, unlike lion and leopard. And that goes for a lot of the prey animals, they see them and just start fleeing for their lives. Orbs, no sign of them at the Balanites on Vulture's Nest. Yeah, I think they've got them, put them out there for my kind. Michael Fleetwood's interested to know if the rain's going to be affecting their hunting. Not really, it's probably going to have a very small impact. Obviously both them and their prey could slip in these slippery conditions, but it's kind of an equal playing field for all of them. They are sight hunters basically, so they run around until they see something and then chase it. And the rain's not really affecting sight at this stage. So, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact at all. If anything, it's going to keep them cool and allow them to hunt for longer. 
Whereas if it was very hot, and they've already made that kill earlier, so that may have kept them satiated if it was a very hot day until it cooled down a little bit later on. further sign Aubrey also doesn't know where they are so we're just going to slowly make our way back in the general direction that they have been moving in and if we don't have any luck I think we're going to head back to camp and start drying out all this equipment and make sure that we are ready for a sunset safari with everything in order. sense in stopping the broadcast now because we still need to get home so we're going to take you along with us for the ride but we are going to be heading straight back state at all so we're down to one camera and that means we are going to call it now thanks very much everyone we're going to cover this camera up now completely and make sure it gets home dry apologies for calling it short but like i said it's been great fun for you guys racing around with brent and the wild dogs and we'll see you all this afternoon
Ah, ah, ah. 